Anyways, so, what's up, Greg? Here we are. Here we are, finally. Finally. Uh, Where's it? Yeah, this looks a lot better than uh, a, a Skype session. I haven't seen you in years. I have no idea when the last time was. Yeah. I saw you. I think it was like five years ago or something. <laughs> you look exactly the same Do as I those five years ago. Yeah. I think that's fine. how time flies. Yeah, true. Anyways, we're back. I'm back in Suriname. Yeah, you got a job. Uh, yeah, corporate life. Uh, corporate life. Lots of stuff to talk about. Yeah. Lots of things happening in the world. Mm-hmm. And we are back, everybody, with casual convos in 2021. So uh, this is the first episode of casual convos in 2021. We'll just have a. You know, keep it casual, yeah. short recap of 2020, Yeah. see what's in store for 2021, and let's get to it. All right, so, great. How was well, your New Year's? Boring as hell, of course, because anyone who knows me knows how boring I am. I slept through the whole New Year, went to bed at 10, 10, and then like, I think I woke up at 12 just to hear all the fireworks going off, and then just back to sleep. Just nothing ever happened. It's basically like that meme, you know, uh, 11.59. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> no, mine's pretty much the same. Uh, not much, yeah, New Year's every year. Not much yeah. to do. You hear the fireworks, bang, bang, bang. Mm-hmm. But that's about it. Yeah, just my, my dogs are getting afraid because of the fireworks. So I, 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 it's not that I get woken by the fireworks, it's that the dogs wake me up because of the fireworks. And then, yeah, once they're awake, and then you just go back to sleep. No big deal. Awesome. <laughs> Did you spend the New Year's here? Or? Yeah, I was already back. Uh, I got back the um, 1st of December, actually. Oh, nice. Yeah, so nice. Not many people knew, but you know, <laughs> kept it low. <laughs> I, I think some people still don't know I'm back. Yeah, so su- surprise to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, guys, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, how would you recap 2020 for yourself? For me? Yeah, personally. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have seen your Instagram and all, all those fancy pictures in New Zealand. You went to the Lord of the Rings locations and stuff. Yeah, you so, are like, this guy. Yeah, <laughs> jealous the whole way. And you've been sharing those pictures. Like, you knew what you were doing yep. and, and you had every I, I, right. I deliberately sent them to your personal DM. Ah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. How was it? But yeah, for, for me, 2020 was a good year. Uh, yeah. Good as an undergraduate, it was a great year for me. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's kind of ironic. Like, yeah. A lot of people, just, you know, dying. Like, yeah, yeah, whoop, whoop, 2020. <laughs> so, it, I guess yeah. it's it's what you make of it. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, the circumstances, um, depending on where you are. I was quite fortunate. Uh, you know, I, I got into New Zealand, like my flight here started... 27th of January. Mm-hmm. I arrived there on the 29th, so basically two days. Well, mm-hmm. you you go in the future, so you be, it's one one and a uh, half day uh, travel. Uh, arrived uh, there on the 29th, <laughs> and they actually closed their borders around the first week of February. So I got Ooh. there one week. Well, not closed their borders fully yet, but that's when you know the restrictions started. Yeah. So I got there like within wow. a one week window of you know everything going smoothly. Wow. So circumstances having you know these fortunate events eh, some things just work out yeah i wanted to ask you because um, the western countries were the first ones to get it because Suriname had the benefit of at least having waited a few months before it started getting here so we had a bit of a head start and at least making preparations and you guys, you, you didn't even know what it was. So, how was the experience like over there? Um, with you guys, you mean me or you know, uh, people in New Zealand in general? They actually uh, news was already spreading because they have uh, close ties with China as well. Mm-hmm. And yeah, when I was on the plane during transit, I lot saw a lot of people with masks already. Oh, really? Yeah, so, uh, especially from the Asian countries. Mm-hmm. Uh, they they were fully masked and all oh, by wow, that they time were already. Ready. So I was like, okay, is this is something new? Maybe uh-huh. not. Um, but yeah, I think they, they they were keeping an eye on it mm-hmm. and they reacted pretty swiftly to when you know shit hit the fan. Yeah, because 
So you were saying that the the peop- the individuals were before the government in positions? Uh, no, the the government actually. Oh, um, okay. I, I I gotta say the government really um, played their part efficiently in that. Wow, government and efficient. <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, because um, February, I think it was the uh, the official lockdown was the first or second week or not the full lockdown, mm-hmm. and you get a notification on your phone like what? the country wide, everyone's phone start beeping loudly like a, a red alert. Whoa! Beep beep beep, starting midnight tonight full lockdown or yeah whoa they, they gave you like hours notice yeah ahead of time the, like, so like they, not they, a week or they, so they had an announcement like the, the press conference uh, uh-huh. you know that this is might be happening but then more developments cases starting to rise and then like yeah beep 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 shorten the lifespan whoa 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 Damn. yeah that's, hard, that's hardcore you guys don't mess around so um yeah just in the order and the prime minister uh Left her mark with her performance during that. <laughs> yeah, during I, I believe she, year, got, actually, she got re-elected yeah, this year, right? Yeah. Did, did that play a, a big impact? Yeah, oh, uh, won by a landslide. Really? Yeah. Wow, good for her. Good for her. So th- that was my year, but uh, my experience there, and after the full lockdown, for like for two weeks, about two weeks, mm-hmm. um, in March, May, and then around June, the restrictions starting to ease up. Mm-hmm. So that's when people were able to go out again, go yeah. out and about, and you didn't have the community transmission was mostly under control. Mm-hmm. And that for the people who are there, especially foreigners, yeah. is actually beneficial because you don't get tourists. Uh-huh. You go to empty places, all the places, tourist free. Oh, aha! You <laughs> so, got the whole country to yourself, yeah, basically. In that way, it, it might sound bad, <laughs> but thanks to... Mm, oh, yeah. that, ooh, mm. that's a big statement. But uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. it's true. But regardless, uh, even if there was no lockdown and you know tourism was in full speed, I think it, it's still a very beautiful place to go. Yeah. And it's so diverse in landscapes uh, mm-hmm. you can find from snowy mountain top to desert to forest in Whoa. one road trip wow one ride Damn. gotta see that someday so yeah i recommend it uh and yeah as you know we started this during yeah. 2020 this was during those two 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 and a half months of lockdown yeah yeah i guess uh, a few good things came out of 2020 not yeah, so um, reflecting back to you, how was uh, it here back for you at home uh, around that same time? Um, because I work in financial markets, you saw some chatter happening around since since 2019, actually. Like all those conspiracies like China's suppressing the virus and it's gonna explode and the world's gonna get infected. Like back then days, those were like full-blown conspiracy theories. That was some Alex Jones shit. But then eventually it started leaking out and then they couldn't suppress it anymore. So a lot of people on Twitter and, and in finance, they had, they had a pretty good insight of what it could be and what could happen. But no one had any idea the scale, the scope of it all and how much damage it would do. So when it came here, I, I can't even remember what month it was. When yeah, because I, I remember when we were in full lockdown there, things were still pretty chill here, pretty under control. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We were, I can remember, like, people in Suriname were kind of laughing at the Western countries, like, haha, look at you guys, you can't even keep a, a tiny little disease in check. But yeah, later on, it, it came over here, and we kind of had to eat our words. But the good thing is, yeah, we were we already had some information and, and people were kind of prepared. We mm-hmm. didn't have the infrastructure to deal with the scope of it all, but we had some information to at least know how to start dealing with it. Yeah. That, that's one of the benefits of being in a, a Latin American developing country. We got it pretty late. But yeah, as soon as we got one case, they closed yeah, all the borders. And, rapidly and they, yeah. multiplies. Wow. And I think it's harder because uh, we, we got like land... We're, we're landlocked, kind of landlocked. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and we don't have enough control over the borders. 
to make sure that people don't cross illegally and stuff. So it, it was kind of impossible but, from the. But beginning. then again, if you look at the I, most of the islands in the region, mm-hmm. they are they are not landlocked. They, they have like natural water bodies of water as a border, and still, yeah, it's pretty. So. Using that as an excuse, I, I'm not too sure about it. So. Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's easy to compare New Zealand and say how you, how good you got, how well you guys did it. And our government obviously is is less competent than a, a first world country. So I guess we we just didn't have the this the sense of scale how to deal with the problem. It's, it's just what it is, man. No, so. but but even so, I I, I I follow some you know developments from different countries around the, the world, like uh, Vietnam, Taiwan. They they handle it pretty well as well. Yeah, th- those were the Asian countries. There's something different about how those Asian countries dealt with it. I, I honestly I don't know enough to give an opinion yeah. about it. So well, and that, I, definitely something interesting to look into. Right? Yeah, I I don't want to say something too negative about yeah. Vietnam, otherwise all, all the dislikes <laughs> just just piling in. I can feel it. Sure, so, from uh, our like, you know viewership just, of, we, we don't know yet. Yeah, uh, we yeah. should actually check the stats. Um, oh yeah, that's a that's a good idea. Oh, but like my mom made ten accounts from all <laughs> over the world. We're worldwide. No, but I, I'm surprised as to how consist well the consistency part is something we gotta work on. But uh, how far? How many episodes we came? Hey, yeah, it's almost like we're professional podcasters <laughs> right now. Yeah. Uh, we might be heading that way. We might be heading that way. Uh, well, look at this setup. Remember the first session we tried to do? Oh, oh God, it's horrible. We did it on Instagram Live of all the places. And we had basically no audio technology. Yeah. Oh, Laptop, microphone. <laughs> yeah. It's a, one, it's a miracle we actually still have that. Like in, in 20 years, we'll look back on that episode and I think, yeah. I we actually did something. I think that, that, that's a gem to look, yeah. look back to. Yeah. It? <laughs> All that cringe. Yeah. It's it's something good actually. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so. And it may serve as some, you know, uh, for anybody, some inspiration. You, you just gotta try stuff. I get really uncomfortable when people start thinking about inspiration and me in the same word. So. Uh, well, yeah. get used to it. Uh, oh boy. You're in front of the camera now. Yeah. Hi, kids. <laughs> Exhibit A, mo- uh, model citizen. <laughs> model citizen? Yeah. yeah. Anyways, um, yeah, from the first episode on um, getting getting our international guests, how was that for you? Oh, yeah. That's something actually you put in quite a lot of work into. Yeah, just, just randomly emailing, emailing people I actually like. I actually use this podcast as an excuse to talk to people I've been waiting to talk to for years. Wait, wait, wait. T- 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 talk. Tell us more about this. Okay, because our first international guest was Ethan Ye. I was a friend from high school, actually. But uh, when he started as an investment banker in Canada, these guys, they barely have any time. So if I had questions for him or anything, just a, a quick reply. And I never really took the chance to start a conversation with him to just call him up and ask him some basic questions because I didn't I didn't think he'd have the time or whatever but when you have the excuse of a podcast Mm. you get him to really know what the conversation is going to be like he's really chill about it so that was a really good experience I really enjoyed talking to him and then our next guest, that was, that was a big one. That was Robert Murphy. Oh, boy. Yeah, P- I, PhD. I was like, how'd you even get this guy on? Yeah, And but, I was impressed. Yeah. But the, so well, how it started was it? The guy, the, the thing about libertarian economists is that they're really small. The community is really small because everyone's either uh, divided on political lines. So people that are really in the center of it all and they don't want any government intervention, those people are really rare and they typically have small audiences. And the benefit when you have a small audience is that you can actually listen to your audience, you can actually reply to messages and see how you've changed people's lives. So I just sent them an email one day and I'm like, your work has really inspired me and I really look up to you as an economist and how you view the world. And he's like, yeah, well, cool, thanks. And he invited me into his private Facebook group where they share memes and stuff. Eventually, I just I just 
I just hit send on that email. Like, would you like to come on our podcast? And then I, I think it was the next day he actually replied. Yeah, he, he was straight up said, yeah, sure, I'd love to, but I can't in the coming one or two months, he said. I, I think I had to wait two or three yeah, months to get him on. Yeah, because his schedule was really swamped. Yeah, he's, he's a PhD economist, of course. He, he does uh, consulting with so many different firms and stuff. So I was really excited about that. And the days leading up to the interview, I was just stressing about about what questions am I going to ask him, what's the structure going to be and stuff. But I'm pretty happy with how it went, considering how nervous I was. Oh, and, you didn't show it at all. Kind of, kind of, kind of. Yeah, sure. There's uh, always room for improvement. No, that definitely. But yeah, when you told me about it, like, okay. Yeah, you, I, I didn't even know how to react. <laughs> yeah, because you'd be surprised how glad people are I just to just talk about the things that they love talking yeah. about. And and that's why I think podcasts are so successful right now. It's just give someone an hour or an hour and a half to just talk about something they're very passionate about. I mean, who, who wouldn't want to do that? I think that that's why people listen to podcasts so much. Yeah. And as you said, uh, for the essence, uh, I, I got a bit, you know, you have that relationship from back in the mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. It's a bit easier. Yeah. But uh, cold emailing someone like, ooh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. But, hey, if you, you got to know. But you, yeah, because once you've established a little bit of common ground, they yeah. don't see you as an enemy, someone who's just going to attack them or just waste their time. When you see that they're gen- that you're genuine, I think they're way more likely to at least respond to your email. Uh, I think there were two people I requested to be on the podcast. I, I sent basically the same email I sent to Robert Murphy, mm-hmm. but they didn't even respond to me. It's no big deal. Like, yeah. If, if like 10% of them simply respond to my email and 5% come on the podcast, it's that, that's amazing. Because we're from Suriname. Do you have, no one knows where that is. Like, and the people we look up to are like the, the, the greats in the Western world. Like if you can manage to get to establish some contact with them, you've already succeeded, man. They mm-hmm. know who you are now. They know where your country is. Yeah, and but your your grandkids could be friends with their grandkids. Like, how about that? And I I think the the way we Robert uh, deceived us as well was very yeah. Because what you, what you didn't see was that um in his face private Facebook group where I was part of like he was he shared the the clip he talked about how much he enjoyed it yeah. and he even shared uh, some of the questions on his own personal Facebook page and on his personal YouTube page because I think he was afraid that we'd ask him the same standard questions that just everyone asks and we actually brought some nuance to the table and I think he was very impressed yeah. by that I, I think that made a good impression on him so if we were to ask him to come on the podcast again I'm pretty sure he'd want to do it pretty yeah sure. But I think now's the time, you know, to lay out some more groundwork. And yeah, yeah, exactly. And there's plenty of guests, I'm sure, we can reach. Definitely. Um, I'm going to start reaching out to some friends I made as well, back in New Zealand. Nice. Um, I think we should just keep this going and especially uh, get some people local yeah. in the space. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid the language barrier might might be an issue because we, we don't speak English here. It's not our native tongue. That would be Dutch. But, uh, I mean, English is almost a second or third, con- uh, third yeah. language over here. So I'm pretty sure it won't be that big of an issue, but uh, it might be a small issue. Well, I think we can make it work. Um, yeah. But slowly building up to it. Uh, that leads me to... Uh, we started this out as casual convos. And yep. we had this chat uh, a few days ago, I think. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of built its way up into a more the, the finance economics space. Yeah. Because um, this just started us as us friends talking about stuff we like. Yeah. That, that, that was the concept <laughs> of casual convos. Yeah. But now we saw just, just by the access we can have to people that it might be a good idea to start rebranding a bit and go a little more, more focused towards yeah. a, generate, uh, a general direction. 
So what name have we chosen, Diego, for the podcast going into the future? Yeah, so the series is going to be, well, with the, the content is going to be, going to fall under the Capital Convos. Yeah. Um, so casual convos will stay. It, it, it will be just our fire side chats having, you know, the casual conversations with some friends. Mm-hmm. But when we're going to talk about, you know, economic specific stuff, investing stuff, the financial world, yeah. we're going to brand it under the capital convos. And that's where we're going to get our future guests on. And yeah. Uh, production line and distribution is going to be under that brand. All right. So as the quasi first episode of the casual, of the See, I'm getting confused already. Right? At the quasi first episode of the Capital Convos, do you want to start manifesting? Who is your number one guest you'd want to have huh. in your wildest dreams? <laughs> My just, gi- just give me one name, then we know, like for ten years down the road, hmm. if we've achieved that goal. Wait, what? <laughs> no, in the in the financial world. Doesn't matter. Uh, d- doesn't matter. And I, it, it has, of course, it has to be related. To yeah. Capital. Capital. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Capital. Hmm. Ramit Sethi. I have no idea who that is. Actually, um, he's. I, I I deliberately didn't pick one of the well-known big mm-hmm. names. Um, I first found out about him on the Tim Ferriss show, okay. one of his podcasts, and. His approach to personal finance. Mm-hmm. Uh, he also got I had a book, um, How to Get Rich, something mm-hmm. very cheesy title. Uh-huh. But and it's just very U.S. focused. Mm-hmm. But if you just skip the U.S. tax stuff, blah 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 blah, in the system, uh-huh. it's very a no bullshit way, straight to the point mm. uh, methodology on yeah. getting your shit together, your uh-huh. personal finance. Okay, so. It'd be pretty cool to like just have give this me guy. like from the book three points that you think made an impression on you. Um, first up, his approach. Uh, you know how people say you know save 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 cut cut save cost don't get that coffee at Starbucks mm-hmm. blah blah blah. His approach is like the opposite. Okay. Cut. Look. Make an assessment of your, you know, uh, expenses. Mm-hmm. What are the biggest expenses in your life? And work on those, the 80%. Ah, that's you, smart, yeah. For example, uh, I use this example a lot. Um, save, like the commuting to work. Mm-hmm. Would it be cheaper to move somewhere that's like a five-minute walk from your work? Ah. Or drive every day, two hours to your work in the long run? Yeah, that that's a really good point, yeah. Or something else, uh, what he also really hammers down about is, you know, just call your bank or the people you have subscriptions with the companies, Mm -hmm. ask them to, if there are fees to something, just pick up the phone, call them and negotiate. Oh, uh, sorry, I I missed this, uh, um, this late fee, uh, Uh this such circumstances, could could it be waived this one time? And really, his listeners or the, the readers... He got a lot of feedback that people actually got a uh, response on, oh, they waived some fees. And that's how he compounded these kind of savings wow. over the years. I should get that book. Yeah, I, I actually got it. Uh, I could bring it next time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, you just skip through the stuff that's, you know, really US focused. But, yeah. And just go through the stuff that you could apply here. I, I'm still processing it. It sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that that that's because I, I I heard of him, uh, heard him talk. So that's one guy that comes to mind. What about yeah. you? Uh, number one guess, it would probably be some type of hedge fund manager. I I think those people are one of the smartest people and the gutsiest people in the whole world. Because it, it's one thing they just know about what's going on. It's a completely different thing to create a whole company that where you put your money where your mouth is and you're willing to take investor money and allocate that towards where you think markets are going to be because it's one thing to say that the price of gold is going to go up Mm. it's another thing to put your own money into gold expecting it to go up 
It's a completely different thing when you have thousands of employees and billions of investor money behind what you think is going to happen to the markets because all your employees are relying on you to make those returns. Your entire business model is based upon that. And the kind, if you can manage to sleep at night knowing that you're responsible for billions of dollars and thousands of people's livelihoods, that is a very interesting person. That leads me to a question, actually. Does this have anything to do with your current role in oh, a professional that, sense? Oh, that's a good segue. My compliments. All right, so um, December 2020, I started off at my new job, which is an investment analyst for an institutional investor based out of Suriname. It's an uh, insurance company called Asuria, and we have quite a large portfolio for Suriname standards. Of course, I'm not this allowed to say how much it is, of course, but it, it takes an, an investment team to manage that portfolio. And because the opportunities in Suriname became very limited, one, because the economic conditions over here and the responsibilities we had towards our pension clients, and we saw that other opportunities were emerging in the United States and in Europe, we decided to allocate capital towards the foreign markets, stocks and bonds, basically. And there just wasn't enough capacity to analyze the financial market sufficiently. So they called me up, said, yeah, do you want a job? Like, <laughs> hell yeah, I do. <laughs> this, so I've been there for a little bit over a month now. And I got to say, it was it, it's a pretty good job. I really enjoy it. People I work with are nice. And, and the, the responsibilities you have, what I was talking about just now, obviously, they're not on my shoulders because there's an in that entire investment team and the CEO is ultimately responsible. But it's a, it's a really big deal seeing how such a, an institutional investor allocates their resources. How does the money get into the account? What are your responsibilities? What are you going to hold? How do you assess what a good asset is to hold and stuff? I think that's really cool. Yeah, but because you're dealing on a scale that's, you know, X times the personal level and you yeah. have to report to yeah, exactly. Because um, obviously, the people that don't know, in March of 2020, there was a massive stock market crash because then finally all the, the, the reality started to sink in how global supply chains and financial markets would have been impacted by the coronavirus. And it just it just fell off a cliff. In a, in a matter of weeks, you saw people's uh, stocks go down 30 40%. And people might think that stocks are just gamblers uh, from people on Wall Street, but it, it's people's pensions, it's people's retirement savings. So those are in the stock market. And people really started panicking. So obviously, the CEO of the company was in a really difficult position because eventually he'd have to report it to his shareholders. Yeah. Because why, why did you lose about 30 to 40 percent of the assets? And, of course, the CEO would have put pressure on the investment manager and that would run up all down the food chain and it would, it would be a big deal. And so. Yeah, this is something we talked about with Ethan as well mm -hmm. uh, where, when he experienced it. So if you, if you guys want to know more about that, check out that episode. Uh, we'll link it down below yeah, as well. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But uh, in interesting, you, you said they reached out to you to you know strengthen their team. Yeah. How did they find out about you? Okay, so um, I've been posting a lot of stuff on... What, what does it take to get, to uh, get on board such a team? Well, uh, I, sorry to burst your bubble, but um, I actually reached out to them first, but that was around in April or May, mm. and they said they didn't have an open position, but they, they, take, my, they take my CV, yeah. and in case they need it, they put it back up. And just for my luck, in October, the person who had my previous position, she left. So there was an opening for me, but they modified the position a bit to fit my skill set mm -hmm. because um, the person that was in my job, they did standard treasury, uh, so cash flow management, typical finance -y stuff, and then the investments as well. But they saw that my skills were more towards investing and foreign investments in particular. So they modified the position a bit. To fit, to fit me towards the company instead of forcing me to be something that I'm not really. Yeah. So I was really not happy to hear that. But 
um, they said that because there's such a lack of people who, who think like I do in certain people that are investment minded and really know how to analyze the financial markets, um, they really don't know where to go. And I'm sure there are a lot of companies here as well who don't know where to find those people because mm -hmm. there's a lot of pension funds here in Suriname and they don't know what to do with their money because the opportunities are really limited. There's only so much real estate you can buy in Suriname. There's only so much you can put in bonds or T-bills and the interest rates keep dropping, but your liabilities stay the same. You have to keep promising a certain percentage to your pension holders. And what do you do when you can't make enough money. You have to find ways to make money. And if there aren't any people here, you just don't know where to begin with. So I'm pretty sure there's a lot of pension funds in Cernum. They want to get out, but they don't know how to do it. So what I would say is, the way I did it, is that just start a LinkedIn page, start writing about financial markets, because people don't know enough about this. So if you start writing basic stuff, this is what happened to the stock market today. This is why that happened today. This is what happened to oil or gold. People are interested. They want to know this stuff, but they don't know how to access that information. So just start small. People will start, will start contacting you. You'll get a following. And if you collect some writings you've made, you've done some analyses on the financial markets, just send it over to some companies. Like, see what they think. Who knows? You might get a request to join their company. But at the very least, they'll know who you are. And Suriname is such a close community. Everyone knows everyone when you start getting high enough of, of the food chain. And, they'll, and maybe the person you emailed doesn't know someone who requires your skills. But they surely know someone who knows someone who needs your help. So just start small, eventually you'll find someone. That's what I say. Because when there's a high demand for people with investment knowledge and there's no supply of people with investment knowledge, you're almost guaranteed yeah. to find a position. And no very well paid position for food. <laughs> <laughs> for now, it, it isn't what I want it to be, but it's a start. Yeah. Because of course, obviously they didn't know what to be expected. Yeah, it's something new, I think, for them as well, right? Exactly, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's something you got to match and actually you're, you're building this position as you go. Exactly. From my understanding. Yeah. So it, it, it's a very long-term perspective you need yeah. to have. Awesome. Uh, and Asiri is one of the, you know, the prominent big insurance company here in Suriname. And yep. they're, they're also in, uh, I think, some of the islands as well, right? Yeah, very exactly. Regional, very regional. Yeah, exactly. So, Yeah. Uh, how is this, aside from them, how are like other insurance companies, investment banks or, you know, any, anybody in the space that's, you think that's active, kind of like how you are? Um, that's a really good question. I don't know enough about local companies to say about that, but I have spoken with uh, one of the, the state pension funds and they are almost exclusively in Suriname because you have to imagine if you send your money abroad, that money is working for the people where you send that money, obviously. So when we invest money in, say, let's take, for example, Apple, Apple gets to use your money to make returns. You just get a dividend from that money. And the, the Suriname pension funds have a, a mindset of, why would I send my money away when I can just send it here, distribute it here, let people here just do something with that money. The problem is obviously there isn't enough opportunity and it's, it's, it's kind of difficult investing millions of dollars here in Suriname when you're unsure what the future is going to hold. But that's definitely their mindset why they have so much money in Suriname. And as far as I've seen, other companies that have allocated towards uh, foreign investments, they're mostly in bonds yielding a, a fixed coupon rate, maybe like 5% or 6% per year. And that, that's enough to, to cover their expenses. But it, it definitely isn't, from what I've heard, isn't on the scale of what Asturia is doing. The, the only other one that can perhaps compare would be Stats only. But that's because they already have the, the infrastructure mm -hmm. and the investment 
uh, capital from, and they have access to a lot of foreign brokers to put that money away. They have the skill set, the know-how, and the capital to access this uh, this kind of skill you need to do that. I think this is a very interesting topic we should cover. Okay. With uh, especially if we can get someone from one of these. Oh. Uh, so if you guys know anybody and yeah. they are be willing to share mm-hmm. about this. Yeah, we we'd love to have them on. So please. Because as you guys see, it, it's something that's you know not widely spread. And yeah. It's very limited, and especially during these times, you you need to know how to, mm-hmm. even from an individual's perspective. Yeah. Uh, exactly. how these things work yeah so because let's say for example stats only there was an article in the news i, I think it was uh, the day before yesterday that they have a hundred million dollars of um, pension money money they owe to their personnel in a few years with interest and they need to find a way to allocate that and allocate it well like, can you imagine the responsibility on Sats Oli's shoulders? How they manage that? Do they have enough capacity? Like, I, I don't really know that. I'm just assuming that they do. So, I would love to talk to them. Just, yeah, obviously, just we shed can, some light on yeah, how these things. Exactly. Obviously, you can't ask them what they're holding, how long they're holding, but just their general investment vision, mm. how they perceive the financial markets, because uh, investing is it's kind of an art form because there isn't a set path you have to take. You can invest for long term short term there's so many asset combinations you can make so how they view the markets and how they view investing that would be really interesting to know yeah just might do that so i I think we got some homework now yeah exactly (laughs) find somebody and we got the topic exactly yeah great so moving on um Mm -hmm. what else do we got uh brewing for 2021 well obviously we're gonna grow the podcast um I'm studying currently for the CFA program. Uh, For the people that don't know what that is, um, it's the highest academic achievement in finance. It's actually better or higher accepted degree than a master's in finance because all the fancy portfolio managers you see at at Goldman Sachs, at, at, at Merrill Lynch, they have a CFA title. It's one of the most prestigious finance degrees and there isn't a single person from Suriname who has that degree. I've just started with it, okay? And it's a doozy. I can see why people say how hard it is. But in perhaps one or two years when I finish the program, I just might be the first Surinamese CFA title holder. He just announced it, people. Yeah, he just before I it. even <laughs> took part in my first exam. Whoa, oh so, boy. Uh, well, it's, uh, the pressure is on. The pressure is definitely on. But if it happens, like imagine uh, how big of a difference it would make. Because um, all I'm pretty sure the investment, uh, the investment firms here over here, anyone who, who invests in the, the foreign markets, they pay a lot of money towards those portfolio managers with the CFA degree just to get a report of what they should do. Because you should you should understand those people here in Suriname, they aren't professional investors in, in the same way because investing in the financial markets is something completely different. And you need to pay a lot of money to access the knowledge of those people with those degrees who spend their lives studying financial markets. And if you pay, like, uh, I'm just throwing a number out here, but if you pay $100,000 for advice on how to allocate your portfolio and you can use that money in Suriname, someone with a team of analysts here in Suriname, you can lead those people, you can educate those people. We can actually bring finance and investing in Suriname to a higher level, which is what we should do in Suriname. And it's an opportunity to surface the region yeah. with this expertise. Yeah, exactly. Because um, every company, of course, has its own individual needs and responsibilities and assets, liabilities and stuff. But if you know how to invest in the financial markets, if you know with a certain, hmm, I wouldn't say certainty, but a probability of what's going to happen in the future and where people should allocate their resources, you can help like 
10 or 20 companies at the same time. Like I can have, uh, theoretically, I could help like 10 or 20 companies in the region and that would put the money back here in Suriname. Why wouldn't that be a good idea? I think it would be a good idea at least. No, definitely stuff to think about. Yeah. Anyways, um, I think we're going to keep this episode pretty short. Uh, we've yeah. covered quite a bit, actually. Yeah. 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 And looking yeah. back at what's in store for us. So, casual convos, um, these topics will be covered under capital convos going forward. Yeah. We don't have a set schedule yet because uh, we're still planning out, um, you know, who we're getting on. Yeah. Exactly. But expect at least one episode a month. Oh yeah, at least at least one episode a month. Mm-hmm. Um, in other news, we have the other series started as well with Chanduk, uh, Social Convos. This has a set schedule and that's a different format because it's also a live format. Mm, nice. Yeah, so that's every Tuesdays at nine PM Suriname Standard Time. Okay. And if people want to tune in, where do they go? It's gonna be live streamed on Facebook, mm-hmm. um, YouTube. I'm not sure on LinkedIn yet. We're still working that one out. Oh, cool. Um, and probably Twitch. So, oh, nice. Yeah, we nice. were trying to cover the live streaming platforms. It's just, you know, an experiment and a commitment to try different formats. So mm-hmm. yeah. this is going to be pre-recorded, different production style uh-huh. compared to that one. And it'd be interesting to see how these different, you know, these series grow. Yeah, yeah I'm pretty sure. It'll be interesting to watch. See how the audiences differ and and what type of people are interested in what type of content and from where. Additionally, we're also finally, finally working on the website. So yeah. um, as you our current viewers know, it's currently hosted on my personal website, but we finally got the confos.com. Please don't go there yet. We're still working on it, but yeah. announcing it now, the confos.com uh, domain. So future episodes will be released there. Uh, they'll still be available on Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, Podcast. Google Podcasts. So yeah. those links will be shared uh, in due time. And yeah, it's a fresh style. Um, yeah. You've seen some, some of the back, back end already. Yeah, yeah, it looks really nice. Yeah, as someone who doesn't know anything about uh, IT, like, I'm, I'm very impressed. So that, that's in the works. Um, oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, mm-hmm. um, I'm going to start next month i think it's february 6th yeah first week of february mm-hmm. i got accepted to the on deck podcasters fellowship oh yeah whoa. so i i confirmed my participation okay no you, you gotta tell the audience what it's about you got it so yeah basically did this happened um got here first week of december mm-hmm. got just got a random email from these guys um you know, telling about uh, they got a fellowship going. They've had this is will be the first podcasters cohort mm-hmm. for the past eighteen months. They had like founders and entrepreneurs uh, workshops. I think they had eight cohorts or something. Oh, wow. And it's a very tight knit community mm-hmm. of uh, they're based in San Francisco. Okay, so pretty close to the tech world, and they have all these different programs to participate in to build a community and they going to bring in experts from the fields um, mm-hmm. different podcasters um, there's VCs um, platforms to use so I'm actually I was surprised to see that email mm-hmm. I had yeah. a chat with the program director and they were as you know we talk about Suriname they were like where is this place Ah, uh-huh. yeah and he, he was like you're definitely the only person I've spoken to from there um, <laughs> so I kind of went through the interview mm-hmm. uh, they liked what, what they heard mm-hmm. and yeah they offered me a spot and I accepted so we'll see how that's gonna work out yeah. I think it will add tremendous um, value to the growth and development of how we're going to build out this podcast exactly yeah That's and additionally access to people because that is one thing that they were hammering on mm-hmm. is, is how to get guests on and yeah. using their, their network oh. to get to co guest each other aha uh-huh. that's really interesting so wow. i think that's going to be something to propel our you know yeah that, that's going to skyrocket our growth 
very interesting. So we, we got work to do uh, from our end as well, the back end. Um, yeah, exactly. But yeah, lots of stuff coming 2021. Yeah. Great. Who knew we'd be in the podcasting world? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, who would have thought? But uh, I'm really glad, really, really glad we took this stuff, uh, took this step. Because there's, because there's so little education over here, there's a lot of room to really make a lasting impact on people. Because people want to know, and we have a lot of information to share. And I think we can both speak of it. Um, just having started this, talking about stuff, mm-hmm. has opened other opportunities for both of us. <laughs> It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And we've barely released like 10 episodes or whatever and already doors are opening up. People are really hungry to access information and there are a lot of... uh, People are a bit ashamed to to publicly address the format but I get a lot of private messages. How do you view this? Uh, What should I do in this situation? And eventually, like people are going to get comfortable sharing that publicly and you'll see that how the scope changes as the, and the conversation changes because people really do want to know. They want to know what's happening in the world. Yeah, definitely. So we're going to wrap this up now. Um, when this episode is released, you'll see all the links to what we've been talking about in this episode, uh, links to the highlights of 2020. Mm-hmm what we're going to do in the future, uh, as well as our Discord server. If you haven't joined yet, it's a pretty cool little community now, especially the most active channels are the investing and economics channels. Exactly. We share stuff there. So if you want to, you know, get no stuff, just hop, join our server. Yeah, exactly. Just give us a chat. Um, Discord is pretty anonymous. You can use a username if you you feel kind of, you know, want, want some private... Yeah, even if you don't know anything, you just want to start from the ground up, we can at least give you the information, tell you where to go and stuff. Because once you you get that first step into the finance world, you know where to go, you can can figure it out for yourself. Because that's how we did it. Yeah, I'm not even a finance guy. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah, but you know enough. Definitely. All right. Wrapping up and we shall see you soon in Capital Congo. Yeah. All right.